That's what we're talking about today, resolving resentment. It's in our healthy series. Our healthy series is the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments are about God telling us how to live a healthy life, spiritual life, family life, church life or temple life in Old Testament times, and even community and social life. And the reason that he gave us the Ten Commandments is so that we would flourish. We do not get to heaven by keeping the Ten Commandments. Amen? There's only one way into heaven. It's by who you know, not what you do. It is by putting your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, who is our Savior, and you trust him to save you. That's the only way you get into heaven. And if you're an Old Testament person, you put your trust in the coming Messiah that was promised. Same person, they just didn't know his name. But they were trusting God to provide the salvation through a paschal lamb that would be a sacrifice for their sins. And that lamb turned out to be the lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world known as Jesus of Nazareth. Amen? The son of God. And so we all get in by putting our faith and trust in God. But the commandments help us live a life of flourishing so that we can fulfill the first and fundamental principle for which we were created to be fruitful and multiply and flourish to rule and subdue the earth in the name of God. And so that's why we're studying the Ten Commandments, because our nation's gotten a little off track, and we're not seeing a lot of flourishing right now. We're seeing a lot of weird stuff happening. Amen? And so we want to start with cleaning up our own life before we decide that we're going to clean up everybody else's life around us. And so that's what we're looking at today. And we're in the Seventh Commandment, and the Seventh Commandment is fundamental principle, thou shalt not commit adultery, is about preserving the integrity of the family unit. The basic unit of the family is the husband and the wife to becoming one flesh. That is the marriage. The children are the fruit that comes from that. But the marriage is the man and the woman. And so the commandment protects the integrity of the family, which is the marriage. And that's why we're spending some time on this. It's pretty easy to understand the commandment, thou shalt not commit adultery. Doesn't need lots of explanation. Any, anyone not understand what that means? Raise your hand high, correct? We'll put you back into the junior high and they'll tell you all about it there. Now, if that's the case, then why are we spending all this time? We're spending this time because we want to talk, how do I build a marriage that is healthy so that the temptation towards that is mitigated to a very insignificant level? Doesn't that make sense? And so we said we're talking about this issue of a healthy marriage, the secrets of a healthy marriage. And we said, number one, it starts with spiritual connection, a connection that is made first between me and God. I need to have the Spirit of God living in me. That's called being born again. That's what happens when I say, God, I know I'm a sinner. I totally own it. I 100% own it. But I can't save myself. I can't be a good person. I need you to save me. And I believe you sent your son to do that. For your, your word says, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. And the word believe means entrust yourself to his care and control for salvation. That's what we're doing. We entrust ourselves to the Savior. And so we call upon the name of the Lord and you'll be saved, it says in Romans chapter 10. So we ask Jesus to come into our life, take away our sin, make us right with God. Now we have a spiritual connection with God. And that spiritual connection with God gives us the power of the Spirit of God in our life. And He begins to produce His fruit in us. And that gives us the capacity to be the person we need to be in order, if you're a man, to be the husband your wife needs. And if you're a woman, to be the wife your husband needs. You have the supernatural assistance of the Holy Spirit who lives within you. Is that making sense? And that's the first connection. And then we strengthen the connection with our spouse by what? Anyone remember? It's on the screen. Oh, no, it's not on the screen. <laughs> it was last night. Sorry. Remember? Pray out loud together. How often? Daily, 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 daily. Correct? And how long are the prayers? Short little prayers, and we grow them over time. Correct? That's the first discipline. And what did we find about that? Remember, these things are based on research. I didn't just come up with something that would think it would sound spiritual. They followed 1,157 marriages for 30 years, and only one, year, one marriage ended in divorce of those couples who prayed out loud together every day. So if you want your marriage to last, pray out loud together every day. 
pray out loud together every day. Then the second one is emotional intimacy. And we talked about that, that there is a four-stage process that you go through. And I'm not going to review that. You can go and watch it on YouTube and get the information. But the point is you want to develop an emotionally connected relationship. And the discipline that goes with that, the research says, is approximately 30 minutes of uninterrupted conversation every day. And it starts with the man who is the leader in the house who says... Tell me about your day and leave no details out. And that takes all 30 minutes. <laughs> and you say anything else if not. And then it reciprocates. If you follow the four-step process, that it reciprocates and all that. But that's the point. That's the discipline that you learn how to do that. Now, I'm going to tell you a secret. I didn't tell you last night but, uh, or yesterday because one of the folks figured it out yesterday and said, is this true? And I said, yeah, I thought it was, was pretty plain and simple. They go, no, no, you never really made it clear. So I'm going to make it clear. You ready? Each one of these build on the next. So if you're having a hard time with 30 minutes of conversation, well, start with practicing prayer. Keep growing prayer. Keep growing prayer. Keep growing prayer. Then the conversation becomes easier. So number two becomes a little easier. Now I'm bonding spiritually. I'm bonding now emotionally. Then sexual satisfaction. And we said, what happens? What's the fundamental characteristic of sexual satisfaction at the very core? It is a physical replication of the emotional intimacy. It's literally the same thing, just lived out physically. So if you're good at number two, number three becomes easy and satisfying. Does that make any sense? So what does we tell you if each one builds on the other? If you're feeling I'm not satisfied, start working on number two. 30 minutes of uninterrupted conversation. That makes it a lot easier to move into three. And how do you strengthen three? Ten non-sexual touches every day. Non-sexual, right? Because no one wants to be manipulated when they're getting, you know, fancy, you know, petty cake time in their eyes. <laughs> they don't want to be said, uh oh, it has that look. Here come the touches. No, you want to be used to touching each other outside of that context. Is that making sense? So that's the purpose of the exercise. Then that leads to number four, and number four is constructive conflict. Because we all run into conflict. And do you remember why we run into conflict? James chapter three. Verse 2, for we all stumble in many ways. Let's say that together. We all stumble in many ways. That was written to Christians, the book of James. We're all sinners. We sin all the time. You get a couple of sinners together in a marriage, what do you have? Conflict. Conflict. And so to deal with that, we have to learn how to manage it. And the discipline is simply this, remembering that rash responses equal ruined relationships. Rash responses equal ruined relationships. That's the discipline you have to remember. That in the midst of all the conflict, button your lips. Listen a lot. If you're tempted to say something that you think is clever, smart, and it's going to win your point and sting them, uh, go take a walk and pray. And I'm dead serious about that. Just say, ah, right, time out. I'm thinking some things I shouldn't be thinking. And, and, you, and you just take a walk, right? Because a rash response, a hasty response, an unthoughtful response ends up ruining relationships. You just can't get it back. And so today I want to talk about the fifth secret to really a healthy marriage, and that is this issue of how to resolve resentments. How to resolve resentments. And resentments, if they're unresolved, end up becoming like the termites of your household. And it just is eating away its integrity and its strength, and over time it's going to collapse. And so we have to learn how to deal with these things. And 1 Corinthians 13, 5 is the verse that I want to kind of build this talk on today, this sermon on. And this is what God's word says. It says, love, in this context, he's talking about love and what kind of love. Do you remember 1 Corinthians 13? You want to remember what kind of love this is? God's kind of love. Love that God puts in your heart when you are born again. It's called agape love, right? God's kind of love does not take into account a wrong suffered. The essence, the essence of resentment is you can't stop taking it into account. It is running through your head all the time. In fact, literally in the original language, it means to occupy one's mind with reckonings or calculations. Every time I see you, uh, that, that wound, that injury comes back to mind, and I'm thinking about it again, and my eyes glaze over. I don't even hear what you're saying because I'm all preoccupied in the back of my mind how I'm going to be able to find you in a dark alley and hit you with a club. <laughs> and you've had those thoughts. 
You know, I remember in, 19, in, in 1992, seven years into the church, a guy split the church, a, a, the number two person in the, in the church. He split the church. Unbelievably painful. Lots of lies going around. So I give him a call, and I say, hey, all these lies are going around. You know they're not true. You need to put them out. And he goes, I didn't start them, so I'm not putting them out. I said, you can't just confront it when they No, I'm not going to. Well, that played, well, obviously, that ended up with a church split, very painful. So what did I do? Well, I didn't forgive very well at first. In fact, I recorded on a tape, my wife reminded me, of all my grievances against this guy. Because <laughs> I thought I could offload it to the tape, put it in my sock drawer, like, you know, uh, President Clinton did with his stuff, put it in the sock. <laughs> Remember the tapes in the sock drawer? Same thing. Got the idea from him. Put it in there and thought, that'll offload my conscience. I won't worry about it anymore. But it didn't really work. But it was in the sock drawer for a long time. Eventually destroyed the tape when I finally got freedom from my resentment. But I would still, and here's how I knew I didn't have freedom, I would have nightmares. More like night pleasure mirrors. Where I would see him in an alley and I have a baseball bat and I work him over and let him know <laughs> that the Lord smote him and he used my hand to do it. Now, this is not a very godly response. I'm just telling you. And I, I didn't make any sins. They were just fantasies while I was sleeping. I can't control that. <laughs> but it's a sign that there's something really wrong inside. Amen? And so that's what he's talking about. It, it, to occupy one's mind with these things all the time. Even your subconscious mind. Even while you're sleeping. Your sleeping mind is thinking about these things. This is not good. It's not good. It's unhealthy. And so if you're filled with God's love, that's not happening. That's not happening. You're not preoccupied all the time. And reckonings and calculations and looking for ways to get them back and having these fantasies and daydreams about it. And that's what happens when there's deep resentments. And so the big idea today is this. To keep love real, I must resolve my resentments. And until I do, everything's kind of faking it on the surface. I'm not really loving anybody. Why? My mind's preoccupied in the back with this. I'm not, I'm not giving this thing up. I'm like a bulldog with a bone, man. You're not getting away from me. And that's unhealthy. And so what then is resentment? It is bitter indignation at having been treated unfairly. Bitter indignation at having been treated unfairly. If you like a better word than unfairly, I would say unrighteously. Because what gives real power to your resentment is that you have a just cause. They really did violate you by the standard of God's word, not just your imagination or you got triggered by some micro expression or something like that. This is a legit serious sin and you actually suffered it at their hand. And that's why it becomes a very powerful tool in the hand of the enemy. And here's my point. Far too many relationships have been all but destroyed by Satan. Because he has been able to prevent the process of forgiveness from taking place by appealing to our sense of justice. It's the righteous cause. This is why it's so hard to get rid of the resentment. You really did me wrong on this deal. And how are we going to make the scales even? How are we going to fix this? I'm not just going to ignore it. And unfortunately, many times Christians are taught to ignore it. And that is not the answer. We're going to find as we, <laughs> this is going to be more than one sermon. I just give you the time. We didn't get through it last night. <laughs> We're going to find that Christians mishandle it most of the time. And the advice they get is not biblical or wise. And it festers in the problem that's associated with it. But we'll continue. His point is devil just says that you're, this was unjust and he just pounds you. And, it, and you agree. It's true. It is unjust, right? And so there's pain and hurt associated. But here's the point God seeks. A higher road that doesn't skip over justice, doesn't skip over the offense, but actually resolves them by going beyond them into the realm of mercy, compassion, forgiveness, and reconciliation. That's God's goal. That's called resolving it. That's how it takes place. Does that make sense? Let's pray, and then we'll get into the details of today's message. Dear Heavenly Father, we love you. We are so grateful that you've given to us your word because it helps us, especially today, in dealing with the issue of resentments and how they can build in our heart, end up becoming really tools of Satan to ruin our spiritual life and poison and contaminate everything we touch. And so, Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit would speak to our hearts 
make us aware of the things that we need to deal with and how to apply your word specifically to the, the situations that we're living in our life if we have unresolved issues. I pray, Father, that we'll learn, even if we don't have unresolved issues, we'll learn to have tools to help our friends who struggle with these things. For I ask and pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so we want to begin today by looking at the causes of resentment, and we're going to do this from the life of Job. He was a pretty good guy, and he had some good reasons to be resentful. He he had some, you know, he he had a bad deal. Read the story. It's a lot of chapters, 42 chapters of this poor guy. And I'm picking out three things that he struggled with from the life of Job. And the first is when people ridicule you. When people ridicule you, that is to make fun of you or to humiliate you. In Job chapter 12, in verse 5, the Bible says, people who are at ease, that means their life is going smoothly, everything is going nicely, we have those ups and downs in our life, and these these guys are on the upside right now, and everything seems pleasant for them. He's talking about that, and he says, they mock those in trouble. He say he's looking at his life. He used to be riding high, and now he's like because he's got boils and he's impoverished, and his, his farm has been destroyed. His kids are all killed. His wife said, "Curse God and die," and he's laying there miserable. And now they're attacking him. And this is what he's talking about. They're mocking him. Well, look at you, big shot, rich guy, fancy pants. You got boils and sap. You know, God must hate you. That's the kind of stuff he's saying. That's, they didn't use the word hate, but they say basically, you know, this is the hand of God. You did something wrong, you know, nonstop. And they're mocking him. Mock those in trouble. That means they make fun of them and they humiliate them. And we mock people by what? Making a caricature out of them. We, we take their weakness and we expand it. So if we think they have a, a big nose, we say, they got a giant nose, Pinocchio nose. Hey, there comes Pinocchio nose, right? So that, that's what mocking is. You're making fun of them. Except for these guys are down and they're getting kicked. And it's not funny. And that's ridicule. That's what it is. They give a push to people who are stumbling. In other words, Job is saying, I, I'm barely functioning here. I got nothing. It says he's scraping his boils and scabs with the pottery that's been cracked. So it means he's going into the junkyard, by picking up broken shards of pottery, and he's scraping this stuff on his arm. And they're making fun of him. They're making fun of him. That's ridicule. And you don't have to be that horrible at it, but any kind of mockery, any kind of making fun of people, it hurts. And so the key is it's not only what people say to you, which is painful, but even worse, it's what they say about you. So in this context of ridicule comes gossip. What is gossip? Gossip is telling the truth that you know about somebody that is unflattering and exposing and humiliating them with it. That's what it is. It's telling the truth. Well, I wasn't gossiping. I was just telling the truth. Yeah, that's the definition. You're telling an unflattering truth to someone who's it's none of their business. That's gossip. It's also slander. What is slander? It's telling a lie. It's making up stuff that isn't true in order to what? Make the other person look bad and then spreading it around. Or there's criticism. And what is criticism? These are all forms of ridicule. It's to pick on them and nitpick them and nit, 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 pick, 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 pick. Until you just, you just take them apart. And they're, you're, you're so full of drilling them with these little nitpicking that you can't see the beauty of the whole. And these are all very painful. And in fact, unjust criticism is based upon judgment often of the motives of another person, something we are completely unqualified to judge because we don't even know our own motives, the Bible says. So how am I going to know your motives? That's for God to sort out, not me. And as a result, it's one of the most discouraging part of a person's life. And the higher the level of leadership they have, the more painful the criticism is. And so as you become more, uh, more, have more influence or leadership in the place you, uh, your place of work or in your home or in the place that you serve, let's say in a church, as you go, you're going to get more criticism because there's more eyes on you. And what ends up happening, or in politics, the same thing, you get more and more criticism the higher you go up. And leaders have to learn how to deal with that, or they blow up. They just, they quit. They go, I can't do this anymore. I don't want to do it. I just want to go go in the back room and, and disappear and do what I can do. 
criticism is very devastating, and that's often why good leaders quit or don't even sign up. You say, why do we have so many bad politicians? Because the good people are smart enough to know, don't do that. <laughs> and now we have to say, you've sat out too long. Get off the bench. We need you back in the game because the pirates and thieves are running the show, and we need some good people in there now. Amen? But it means you're going to be criticized. So you think, I'm thinking God's calling me. Understand he is, and you're going to get criticized tremendously. Tremendously. They're going to ridicule you. The second way that uh, Job talks about this is when people devalue you. We all want to be seen having the value that God's placed on us. Or at least a reasonable facsimile thereof. But notice what he says here. He says, why are we regarded as beasts? As stupid in your eyes. You ever been around somebody think they're you're stupid in their eyes? Been around, you know, you just feel it. You just feel it. I remember a number of years ago, I was doing a wedding on the East Coast in uh, Newport, Rhode Island, with all these rich guys. And uh, the family that I was doing this wedding for the, the, they had two sons. One of the sons was getting married. And the two sons were given, as they graduated from Harvard, they were given a Holiday Inn in a major city from their dad. So they each owned a ho Holiday Inn. And I remember, they didn't know who I was. They didn't know I was going to be the pastor performing the ceremony. And so I'm at this big house. And this house it was a house that George Washington had, ate, had eaten in. And, New, you know, Newport Road is full of these rich guys. And I'm just this schmuck from, you know, Orange County. Just a regular guy. They have no clue that I'm a pastor. And they said, so where did you go to school? Because they went to Harvard. And so uh, I said, well, I, I went to Biola, a little, you know, Christian college. You know, I started at UCLA, but I went to Biola and then Talbot. Oh, so that's where you went to school. And then I could see it in their eyes. So you're a dope. <laughs> you're not smart like us Harvard guys. And it didn't bother me. Because I began to engage them on talking about the history of the American founding because we're in a house that George Washington had dinner in, right? And I remember I got to a point and everyone's around and I said, you guys never studied. <laughs> and they looked at me. I said, you don't know what you're talking about. And they go, what do you mean? We went to Harvard. And they go, guess what? I could go to junior college and learn that Abraham Lincoln is the 16th president of the United States. And the two plus two equals four. I don't need to go to Harvard there. You guys either never studied or they're teaching the wrong stuff at Harvard. <laughs> well, the gal that I was marrying, this marrying into this family comes over and says, that was so great. Keep it up. These guys are driving me crazy. <laughs> and so I did keep it up a little bit. <laughs> this is called more retribution than really godly behavior by the pastor. But it ended up being a very fruitful deal in the end. And uh, I, I'll just leave it there. there. I had like 15 stories to go with that. I don't want to get lost. <laughs> oh, anyways, when this happens, here's the key that we want to learn. How you value me is revealed by the way you treat me. How you value me is revealed by the way you treat me. If you treat me like trash, it means you think I'm trash. If you treat me like I'm stupid, it means you think I'm stupid. If you treat me like I'm inferior, it means you think I'm inferior to you. On the other side, if you treat me like a treasure, it means you treasure me. If you treat me as valuable, it means you value me. So you don't have to figure out whether the person values you or not. You just look at the way they treat you. If they treat you badly, they think, they think badly of you. And so the principle is this. Value is expressed primarily by the expenditure of three things. Time, energy, and money or treasure. Jesus said... Where your treasure is, there shall your heart be also. And your treasure, he's using the broadest sense of those things that you see as valuable. And the most valuable thing you have is what? Time. Time. It's the only thing you can't replace. It's time. So where you spend your time, where you spend your energy, which is enthusiasm and, and, and uh, investment of your, of your psyche into the environment or into the other person's life, and where you uh, expend your other resources, that's, where you're, well, that's what you value. So I could look at your calendar and your you know, credit card statement and observe you when you're around people or circumstances, and tell you what you really value. And I, I could not even know your name, but just look at those three, and I would know exactly what you value, what you don't value. 
Those are the things that communicate value. So we're talking, this is all in the context of marriage. These principles go beyond marriage. They go into the workplace. They go into friendships. They go everywhere. But in the marriage in particular, what are you doing with your time? What are you doing with your energy? What are you doing with your resources to invest in your family, in your spouse? And it's mom, dad, how's it going? That's the key. And if you get diverted from that, it begins to be very painful. And that is exactly what Job is talking about. The number three is when people betray you. And I want to talk about this as a very important issue. It creates tremendous hurt. And I remember I read a study about five or six years ago, might have been longer, maybe seven years ago, by a woman who was a Christian and a psychiatrist who was viciously betrayed. And so she went to her pastor at her church to get counsel. And she got some counsel from him and would refer to other counselors in the church. And she was stunned at how poorly Christians deal with the issue of betrayal. It was abysmal. She said, I, I, I cannot believe how twisted and shallow Christians view betrayal is. This is the most devastating thing that can happen in your life. And it's not, ah, forget it and move on, which is the normal Christian answer. Just trust the Lord and move on. Well, you need to trust the Lord, but it's going to take more. You got to do your part, correct? The horse is prepared for battle. The victory belongs to the Lord, it says in Proverbs. Your job is to do the preparing of the horse for battle and then trust him when the fight comes. But you can't sit on the horse and not fight. You got to fight. That's why you prepared the horse, correct? So God's not going to win the battle with you with your hands in your pockets. You got to go out and fight the battle. And a superficial Christian answer that says, no, you just stand there with your hands in your pockets. No, that's not how it's going to work. It's not how it's going to work. So I want to read to you this issue of what is betrayal. Notice what he says here, by the way. He says, my best friends abhor me. Those I loved have turned against me. You see, we resent those who are closest to us, like our best friends who abhor us, because they have the greatest ability to hurt us. And when they turn against us, as Job talks about here, and betray us, it is super painful. Consequently, resentment is found most often in families, in businesses, in business partnerships, I should say, and in volunteer organizations like churches. When, the, where the, when betrayal has occurred, that's where it hurts the most. And the three more main forms of betrayal, which is intentionally breaking trust. That's what betrayal is, intentionally breaking trust. Our number one, cheating. And cheating is, I behave dishonestly to gain an advantage. I behave dishonestly to gain an advantage. You ever play Monopoly with your friends or your brothers and sisters growing up? Someone's slipping their hand into the bank. You ever seen that? Never happened in your family. Well, I have four brothers and th two, a sister and two stepsisters, so I saw it a lot, right? You, whoever's the banker needs to put the money across the room because people had to get their fingers in there, right? They're cheating. Uh, our slander. I make false statements to damage you. That's the purpose. I tell lies about you. I twist things. And the third is disloyalty. I expose your weaknesses or break my promise to you for personal gain. All these things are for personal gain, to get a leg up to advance myself at your expense. These are forms of betrayal. So I want to read to you, I did some research on this again this last week, and I came across a great uh, research uh, that was done by a professor of psychology at the University of British Columbia, and he published it. You can read the articles, many, many pages. I've, I just took the abstract on the front of all research. They have abstracts or summaries. And this is what he says, it's on betrayal. That's psychological analysis is the title. Betrayal is the sense of being harmed by the intentional actions or omissions of a trusted person. The most common forms of betrayal are harmful disclosures of confidential information. Harmful disclosures of confidential information. If you can't keep a confidence, you can't be a friend and you shouldn't be in a close relationship with anybody. That's called gossiping, correct? And other forms of doing that. Disloyalty, we just covered that. Infidelity, that is obviously adultery in a marriage. And dishonesty, just out and out lying. They can be traumatic and cause considerable distress. 
The effects of betrayal include shock, loss, and grief. Morbid preoccupation. In other words, they can't get it off their mind. It keeps coming back and back and back. In fact, when someone is betrayed, and you know them and they're your friend, they tell the story all the time, over and over and over and over and over. And you're tempted to think, man, I already heard this, man. I heard the story like 15 times. Can you please stop? Do not say that. Do not say that. Let them tell the story. I'll explain why in a, se- in a minute or so. But what they're trying to do is reconstruct the fragmented and shattered pieces of their soul by re-examining them and trying to put them back together by telling the story over and over, looking for where the fault lines were. It's devastating. So we'll continue and we'll talk about it more. Not frequently they produce... The betrayal, not infrequently, not infrequently, they produce life-altering changes. Once you've been really betrayed, it changes your life moving forward. And we'll explain why in a minute. The effects of a catastrophic betrayal are most relevant for anxiety disorders. So it creates anxiety disorders like OCD and PTSD in particular. So it's like you were, went to Afghanistan for six months and served a tour of duty and guys were shooting at you. That's as bad as the effects on you as betrayal. You have a serious issue now that's hitting you. Betrayal can cause mental contamination and the betrayer commonly becomes a source of contamination. So the person that did it has a tendency to repeat over and over. And the person that was affected by it also has a tendency to contaminate other people with this issue of betrayal. So it has this toxic effect on both people. And then he goes on and talks about it in some multiple pages. I'm going to end the, the abstract there. You say, okay, that's interesting information. What does it look like in real life? So what I did is I transcribed a portion of Dr. Jordan Peterson. You know who he is? He did a lecture on this. And I edited the lecture, and I'll read to you, because the first half he demonstrates it by illustrating, and then he talks about the principles. We don't need to do that. I'll just read to you his illustration of how it works. He says this. He's talking about a guy who was betrayed in his marriage. He says this. How long have you been married? Is the whole damn thing a lie? Is every relationship you've ever had a lie? Are you a complete doormat? Are you blind beyond capacity? Have you married someone who is psychopathic or narcissistic? Do you have a pattern of associating with people like that? Those are all questions that are going to plague you and should plague you in some real sense when something like betrayal happens. In other words, those are the questions you're asking yourself. You're doubting yourself. You're questioning yourself. You're re-examining yourself. So the first issue is, what the heck happened? And man, that can take thousands of hours. Hours that should have been used in discussion with your wife before this happened. Trying to get to the bottom of it. So when your friend is telling the story, he needs to tell it thousands of times. Thousands of times. He's trying to figure out what's wrong with him and how to put the pieces together. He continues. <sighs> trying to get to the... And man, that can take thousands of hours, hours that should have been used in a discussion with your wife before this happened, trying to get to the bottom of it. People are often traumatized by that kind of revelation, and there's reason they're traumatized as well. Imagine you have, committed, you have a committed relationship with someone, And so you might ask, what is the basis of that commitment? There is a hierarchy of commitment in that. Some commitments are more fundamentally important than others. And those are the commitments upon which all other commitments rely. So if you're in a close relationship, and he's talking in the context of marriage, the most fundamental commitment you have in your life if you're in a marriage is what? To your spouse. That's the thema, and their commitment to you is the same. That's the most fundamental That's his point. There's a hierarchy. You have to understand that. And the most fundamental is the most important because everything's built upon your understanding of that relationship. So when you set up a household with someone and you move towards a permanent, intimate relationship and hypothetically in that direction of, let's say, having dependent children, then you're doing all that is based on the presupposition that the person you married 
is faithful to you because that's one of the defining attributes of the relationship itself. And so when that axiomatic presupposition is shattered by betrayal, then everything that is dependent upon it is now questionable. Do you hear that? Everything in your life now is being reexamined because that's the fundamental relationship in your life. It is the standard by which you measure all other relationships in every area of life. And that has just been exploded. And you're looking at just pieces and fragments of cement everywhere, no longer a foundation. And so he says, and that not only includes the present. What the heck is going on now? But it includes the future. What are we going to do? Who am I anyways? And also into the past. Because you were living, let's say, in something approximating a fool's paradise. Did you get that? When you are betrayed and you're aware of it, he's saying what happens, it leads to a cataclysmic confusion over who you are, where you are, what is going on, how I evaluate other relationships, how I understand love and trust and faithfulness and loyalty and every other thing about every relationship that I've ever been in in my entire life. So when they're telling the story over and over again, they're trying to figure all that out. You have disassembled them at the core of their soul. That's what he's saying. And nothing you thought to be the case was in fact the case. And so that's a dreadful problem. And how you cobble something like that back together is a very, very difficult problem. I would say the first thing you do is open yourself up to the admission of the magnitude of the problem. And this is my criticism and that psychiatrist woman's criticism of the church. They don't accept the magnitude of the problem. It's catastrophic. It's a betrayal. And what is a betrayal? It's treason in the relationship, right? So when you, when you think of it, how many of you know someone who named their child Judas Iscariot? <laughs> Nobody. Right? How about Brutus? Nobody. How about Benedict Arnold? Meet my son, Benedict Arnold. Now, I bet most of you don't even know what Benedict Arnold actually did. But you know one thing? He betrayed the country at George Washington. We know that much. This is how devastating it is. It's catastrophic, right? So you have to look at the magnitude of the problem. What is the problem? Who am I? Who am I anyways that this happened to me? Who are other human beings that they could do this to another human being, right? So those are fundamental questions about the nature of social relationships themselves or even about I the individual's identity. Very, very unsettling questions. Someone I loved has the capacity for that magnitude of betrayal. That is a dreadful realization, not at least in part because it also implies to some degree that you also have that same capacity. See, that's the other thing. You realize for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So I need to take heed lest I fall also. Remember what the researcher said that I, from British Columbia? Once you've been betrayed, you become a toxic person that tends to infect others with it. That's the awareness. And so he says this. Dante, the famous author of the Inferno, discusses a hierarchy of evil and reprehensibly, reprehensible behavior. And at the very bottom of the pit of hell are the most despicable, horrific, and evil possible people. They are located at the very bottom of hell. They are those who committed betrayal. And the reason he felt that the worst possible people are those who committed betrayal is because betrayal is a violation of trust, which is the most fundamental bedrock of all relationships. When trust is betrayed in a relationship, it makes a mockery of everything. The relationship consists of, was founded upon, and was believed to be real in the first place. That is all exploded. It throws the victim of betrayal into a vortex of personal existential chaos. There's a thought. What happened? Who am I? Where am I? What is real concerning the past? What is real concerning the present? What is real concerning the future? What is real about who I am? My personal, personal reality has just been shattered. End quote. 
Do you understand the magnitude of betrayal? Do you understand how devastating that is? Do you understand now why those people might feel a little resentment? You just, you just took everything out. Now, here's the point. You ready? It's not okay to live in that resentment. You have a good reason to feel it, but you have to move through it. And we can't just say, well, just say you're sorry, and, you know, forgive them and move on. You, it's going to take a lot more than that. It's going to take a lot more than that. Is that making sense? And that's why we're talking about this issue of resentment, because once it gets in there, man, it can create problems. And so what's the cure for resentment? Well, you kind of all know it's forgiveness. In Colossians 3.13, it says, you must make allowance for each other's faults and forgive the person who offends you. Remember, the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. What this tells us is that we have three options. Option number one is we can bottle it up. In other words, uh, just suck it up. And if I do that, I can't forget it. This causes stress, a dishonest lifestyle. It eats at me, and it just creates all kinds of problems. And as long as I hang on to the hurts from the, yesterday, I continue to pay the price today. I feel burdened by the pain of the offense. I'll feel awkward and fearful about running into you in public. I'll worry about what I may have told others about you. And I will struggle with anger, guilt, rage, and shame. And so the point is, ultimately, when I bottle it up instead of forgiving, I allow the past to eat at me and eat me alive and destroy my life today. I live a tormented life every day, and we'll see more about this later. But that's it. So if you take option number one, it doesn't go well. Can you tell? Well, option number two is generally the preferred option by strong people. You rage against it. <laughs> Those who hurt you continue to control you, however. Your conversations are filled with cruel and bitter criticism, vitriol, and your attitudes are tainted with hate and fantasies of violence and even dreams of violence, correct? <laughs> this is what happens when you're raging against it. I can't wait to get my chance, right? And when I rage against the hurt and betrayal, I fill everything in my life with a toxic poison of bitterness. So the third answer, which is really the only one, is to let it go. It's the only answer without complications. There's only one effective antidote to resentment, and that is to let it go. God calls this antidote forgiveness. And here's the deal. It isn't as simple as it sounds, and if you don't deal with it properly, you will be infested by demons. And that's next week's message, so let's close in prayer. Our time is gone. Our time is gone. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we love you, and we understand that you love us, and that's why you give us the capacity to forgive and to deal seriously with these things that eat at our soul. And you want to let us live free lives that are empowered by your Spirit. And so, Lord, I pray that as we reflect on these issues today and into this next week and prepare to hear the message next week, I pray that your Holy Spirit will give us guidance and comfort and wisdom and that we will be able to deal with the issues as they come to the forefront of our mind this week and prepare our hearts to hear your word next week. We love you. We thank you that you will never leave us nor forsake us, that you're always with us, and that we can rely on you because you will never betray us. You are a faithful, faithful God, and we love you for that. Amen. <laughs>